Welcome to episode one of season two of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Monday the 30th of March 2009 and I'm Davey. With me this week are Simon. Hello. Alan. Hello. And Tony. Hello. And we also have our producer helping away with our Twitter and keeping us all organised. Yeah, I'd like to say how nice it is to have Simon back with us. Yay! Yay! I'd like to say um, the producer is in fact Laura. I, 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 I neglected to mention that. Yes. Hello, you, Laura. You, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> okay so what's in the show this time uh we have a rundown of what we've been doing since we last podcasted we've got an interview with scott james remnant the canonical ubuntu developer person of course we have the news and we have a section on jaunty we've got a brand new competition and lots of your feedback as part of the new feel for season two we're going to try to do as much of this possible in one shot to kind of reduce our burden of producing the podcast which should mean that firstly It'll be out more regularly, and secondly, more secondly, mistakes. you'll get more mistakes. So you're going to have to bear with us as we get used to this, but you know, it might take us a couple of episodes, but we'll get there. So we've been off the air for quite a while, and uh, we've been doing uh, quite a bit of stuff. Um, so should we ever talk about what we've been doing whilst we've been gone? Yes, that sounds like an idea. Simon, you first. What have you been doing? Um, I've been fairly busy with... Um not Ubuntu, actually. Um, Ooh. Well, Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, I've been playing with Crunchbang. Actually, I like getting rid of the mouse, uh, and all of my PCs are really quite old and slow. In fact, I've renamed my laptop Sloth. Um, <laughs> so I've been playing with Crunchbang. That's um, good fun. Um, so this is what we we talked to um, Phil Newborough about um, many well, moons ago. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. about a year ago now, wasn't it? <laughs> Back in season one. one. And, um, and and back at that stage, it was just a trial project. He was just doing it for, for a laugh. It wasn't going to be a serious distribution, was yeah, it? Yeah, it's quite good. It's very good. I it's like really it popular. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So remind us what the difference between Crunchbang and, say, Ubuntu is. Uh, yeah, it uses Openbox, and um, I think they've stripped out some of the packages and made it quite lean. And Yeah. So when you say you don't need the mouse... Can you use it just totally without a mouse, just using the keyboard? Pretty much. Yeah, you can get to the menu um, using... Um, I thought you were joking when you said you don't need a mouse. I was going to pick you up on that. No, no, really... seriously. No, really? no, it's great. It's really good. All right. Yeah, um, and that's one of the um, appealing features for me. So why have you been using that rather than Ubuntu or whatever? Just for something different. I wanted to, to try something different. Uh, you know, GNOME was getting a little boring, and I wanted to try something different. Is it faster on your it's, little PC? It's meant to be, and it, it probably is. Uh, don't they ship a uh, system uh, status thing for the desktop already on there? Conky. Conky. Conky yeah, I like one. that. I've, uh, I've had uh, fun configuring that. You can do all sorts of funky stuff, email notifications, system notifications, weather, all sorts. Yeah, okay. people post their Conky RC files online. There's like a big community of people who take a screenshot of the desktop and then post their conky stuff. It's really good. Yeah, good fun. Just okay. something different. So what have you been doing then, Alan? Um, oh, I after something Dave said in last year, I've been meaning to set up a Pixie boot server at home so that it makes it easier for me to install, uh, reinstall Ubuntu um, so I can boot machines over the network. Um, I've got a machine, one of my Viglins actually. All right. And um, I've installed a PXE server on it and it's got an image of the, the cut down ISO Mini ISO, whatever it's called. Just how often do you hose your box that you need a Pixie Boot server? Well, not that often, but when you're testing and stuff you want to reinstall or you want to test the install process, it's quite nice to just plug it into a network and not have to burn a DVD or a CD and not have to monkey around with USB sticks. You just plug it in, it boots off the network and off you go. And you already have a, a local mirror, don't you? So, yes. So I, I, I should actually say at this point, I did have a local mirror, but I messed up my Drobo and lost it all. Oh, <laughs> no. Drobo in not being very good, shocker. Actually, it was more of a Popey not being very good and not realising that when you stick a paperclip in the back, the reset thing actually formats all the discs. No! <laughs> that is a bug, really, isn't it? Well, it is, well, a... it is well documented and you have to poke it in while you turn the power on and hold it in there for like eight seconds or something. But I, I thought I was firmware resetting it and I actually wiped the discs and then when I booted it up, I thought, ah, oh, no, that that wasn't what I wanted. That's the sort of bug that it takes a real idiot to manage to implement. Yeah, but, no, but yeah to hands fair. up. I did. Yeah, but to be fair, you, you expect a reset just to clear the settings, not to clear the data. Yeah, I did actually expect that. But that's because I didn't RTFM. 
Yeah, but who does? I mean, come <laughs> well, on. yeah. Thank you for being so kind and not <laughs> telling me I'm just a complete idiot. And the other thing you were doing, the truth. at the end of last season, you were telling us all about your KDE experiment. You were loving the KDE. You are all about the K. I'm going to use KDE for six months, I believe, were your exact words. Like, come hell or high water, yeah, I will be using KDE. I will lo- use it for a whole release cycle, and I'll be able to review it fairly at the end of that six months. How's your KDE experience I'm going? not seeing KDE on that laptop. No, I got rid of it. <laughs> and Why? Uh, because I found it slow and painful and not intuitive. And it got in the way. I I wanted to get on and do stuff with my laptop. And to be fair, most of the time I only use my laptop for an SSH session and a browser window. I do everything with Google Docs and I use Gmail and everything and I rarely use local apps, but it still got in the way and I didn't like that. I think you were finding some well-known bugs as well, weren't you, that there just didn't seem to be any movement on? Uh, Well, there were a few bugs, yeah, and and performance was dire as well, Uh, so... So, yeah, I'm back on Gnome at the moment. Okay, so over to the one and only Dave Walker, who's been guest starring on other podcasts that shall remain nameless for now. Um, What have you been doing the last couple of months? Well, uh, since we uh, we were last out, uh, I've been uh, organising a bug jam for the Ubuntu UK Loco. Uh, We actually had two. We had one in uh, Birmingham and one in London, and and they were a big hit. We had a better turnout than expected. You went to both, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, the uh, the credit card for the train took a bit of a hitting on that. Ooh, so. <laughs> on the same day? Uh, no, uh, okay. I went to the Birmingham one on Friday and the London one on the Saturday. It's like Phil Collins at Live Aid, <laughs> flying <laughs> on a jet from London I to I should New have York. got a private jet, shouldn't I? Yeah. I would have rocked. I should have been on Canonical One. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened at the bug jam? Well, we jammed about bugs. Uh, what we what we did is we had an intro session uh, where we talked about basically how to get started on Launchpad. I mean, some people there didn't uh, even have Launchpad accounts. Now, for those that don't know, Launchpad is the bug tracker for the Ubuntu project. And that's where we plan um, what, what actually happens. It's kind of surprising for us that people don't have Launchpad accounts, really, isn't it? Because we've had them for years. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I, well, okay, maybe not surprising to Simon. I actually logged into mine the other day. <laughs> yes, very, time yes. you subscribed to a bug, didn't you? I, I did, yeah. Okay, what else have you been doing with the loco? Um, also, planning the release party for London. Um, the uh, Cat Kinney at Canonical has been, has been has organised a venue, which is really good. And uh, so we should be looking at that. And then, When's that? That is on the 23rd of April. Listen to out for all the details in the news and events section coming up later. Um, all sorts of little things, really. Um, I got myself an Acer Aspire 1, um, I think it was in January which is kind of one of these little netbook things. It yeah, you ran out at the lug meet, didn't you, to Asda? And- <laughs> yeah, there was a rumour going around that Asda had them for sort of 250 quid, I think. No, it was 150. 150 quid, yeah. yes, that's right. You have um, so much money, it doesn't matter. <laughs> 100 just, pounds here or there. Just call me Mark Shuttleworth. Um, <laughs> and there's a rumour going around they were, they were in Asda for a really good price, and you came with me, in fact, and we drove off like two excited geeks, stupidly excited, particularly you, as you weren't actually buying one. Yeah, I like to watch people spend their money. Yeah. We drove away to Asda in the middle of a lug meeting and got one and rushed back at the end and opened the box up and everybody stood around and went, oh, isn't it shiny? Um, and then I started it up and saw Olympus and thought, what can I replace this with <laughs> uh, really quite quickly? So I'm running Easy Peasy on it. Is it good? Um, That's the what was Easy uh, Ubuntu or something? Uh, it, it, was, it, it was a Ubuntu netbook remix. No. no, it wasn't. It is essentially the Ubuntu netbook remix. It's the same interface as that. Um, what was it called? It's e- e- Ubuntu. E no E Ubuntu yeah was it E Ubuntu I think it was no, yeah right. I think they've actually changed their name now haven't they yes yeah, it's just peasy. easy peasy there's also a little bit of trademark uh, email going around I guess <laughs> um, but yeah it's it's working pretty well quite pleased with that um, and I judged the next round of the Ubuntu Free Culture Showcase oh for what goes in the examples folder yeah um, and this time we had photographs in it as well which is new and that's been one of the things I'm more interested in uh, it was really good to see all those submissions how did you judge that. You just uh, look at them and just pick your favourite. And, yes, and uh, at least one of the ones that I liked must have made it onto the short list. Are you going to tell us which ones you voted for? Uh, I can't remember genuinely off the top of my head which ones I voted for, but uh. um, there were about three video submissions, I think, so they were all pretty much on the short list. Um, the photographs were, there were a lot more of those, so it was a bit more choice. So who, actually, were, who actually chose it then, if you guys voted for it? Uh, I think about four, four judges, and we all voted for our favourite three in each category, and then I think it went off to the community council. Um, to make the final decision about what, what went on there. So I can't take any credit or blame for the uh, <laughs> actual contents on the CD. Um, but yeah, some really interesting sort of submissions and some ideas, and it's great to see people kind of wanting to contribute. Cool. We should actually try and get one of them, uh, one of the actual contestants or winners, to uh, to interview, shouldn't we? Yeah, yeah. We'll see if we can sort that out for next time round. Yeah, that's a good idea. 
Okay, and uh, Simon, you've been playing with Asterisk again, have you? Yeah, lots of good fun with um, Voice Over IP. A bit of help from Davey, which is, <laughs> uh, which is good. Um, it's actually been quite quite easy to do, actually. Uh, a few pointers, but um, if you get the Asterisk book, it's um, it's quite easily done. And that's a free download from o- O'Reilly. Yeah, I've got it? both. I mean, I, I got, the, uh, got the PDF and then I bought the book. So what have you got it doing so um, far? Pretty much everything. Sit at home. Making and receiving making calls. Making and <laughs> receiving calls. So I can dial out um, out into the normal phone network, um, receive incoming calls. I can do um, voicemail, all that sort of good kit. Um, so, so you're the place you're almost ready to cut off your landline now. Yeah, but you're ADSL though, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Yeah, so you can't actually cut off your no, phone. No, no, sorry, I'm cable. Oh, oh, you're okay. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm ah, cable. Yeah. So I could cut uh, my BT line. So you reckon that Don't anybody know. could actually get a gastrisk up and running? And where are you hosting it at home? Or? It's on my um, VPS, okay. actually, so that's quite useful. And reliable enough? And yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't know about cutting just yet. <laughs> we'll see. Do it. Do it. Go on. Yeah, I'm you've, got a, you've got a mobile anyway, haven't you? So you've well, got a backup. Yeah, that, that's true. That is true. And all the kids have got them as well, and your wife's got yeah, one. Yeah, we've all got our own mobiles. So are you, so you, you going to start, start yeah. doing the funky sort of distributed phone system that Dave does so that when somebody calls him in one location, it rings in about three different places around the face of the earth? It is really, really easy to do. And actually, once you get into it and understand how it works, you're really limited by your mind. Actually, it, it, it's the mind do. frame of actually um, of actually working out how to actually, um, how Asterix sits in the in the in the sort of line of it, isn't it? It's working yep. out the actual dial plan. Yep. Well, once you've got your head around that, then then you're sorted, I think. And the great thing is you can um, get a little um, voice over IP handset or use some software on your laptop. Go to a hotel anywhere, plug it in, and you've essentially got the same phone that you have at home. Now, of, of course, Tony was sharing a uh, room with me at the last UDS, <laughs> yeah. and I actually had a, a hard phone there with me. And uh, I got yeah, we, we arrived at the hotel, and the first thing Dave did was open his big suitcase and he starts pulling out a miniature data center <laughs> <laughs> phones and switches and wireless access points and cables yeah. and yeah. setting it all up and essentially he set up his office in this hotel in uh, california with a uk phone number with a uk phone number which he then used to try and order pizza from an american <laughs> pizza house it was cheaper to do that than it was to use the hotel phone they were slightly confused though weren't they by yeah. the number <laughs> british number phoning yeah. for a pizza but, around the corner oh but the, the thing that um the thing that i think had probably annoyed you most was the fact that we actually had a call at four in the morning didn't we yeah that, that, that woke us up on more than one day was that yeah oh my uh... <laughs> oh i got over it <laughs> never sharing a room with you again <laughs> okay well that's about what we've been up to we've got an interview now which i recorded at fosdem which was a couple of well a month ago february um we interviewed scott james remnant from ubuntu and can i call about upstart and boot speeds <laughs> Laura and I are here with Scott James Remnant from Canonical. How are you doing, Scott? Hi, not too bad. It's a bit cold. <laughs> what are you doing here at Fosdem? Um, I'm here to give a talk, which I've just given about Upstart and the roadmap for 1.0. Okay, so Upstart is? Ah, so Upstart, yes, it's the um, replacement init daemon that Ubuntu and now Fedora use. It uh, repl- replaces the old System 5 init and uh, hopefully fixes it. <laughs> now, Ubuntu's had it for a little while, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, we've, we've had versions of it for about uh, two years now. Yeah. And I didn't know Fedora had just started to use it, though. So what release was the first one for Fedora? Uh, Fedora, their first release they shipped it was in uh, Nort- no, sorry, they sh- was in Fedora 10. I have to remember their version numbering there for a second. I was on SUSE. Um, yeah, they, they, Fedora 10 was their first version, and they're including it in Fedora 11 as well, obviously. So, so what's the advantage of it over the old System 5 in it? Um, well, at the moment, it's mostly... It, it's compatible, so you, you can replace it. The code's a lot better, it's maintained, and uh, you know, we, we respond to bug reports. The, the Sys5 init up, upstream is, on a, is, is yeah, long since uh, passed onto other things. So, um, But in the future, it um, provides a lot of service functionality that Linux is missing that you, you get on commercial distributions and in, uh, like Mac OS X. So. And how do normal users notice that it's changed? Well, hopefully. I mean, if we're doing our job right so far, our normal users never noticed. So um, what you, you know, normal users will start to see in you know, a couple of releases' time is going to be that they have more 
more, the, the computer comes up faster, they have more resources free when they're not using certain pieces. You know, if you're not using a, a Bluetooth card, you don't need a Bluetooth stack. If you're not using a printer, you don't need all the printer stack loaded. Um, and you may start, if, you, if you're a power user, you may start to see sort of configuration GUIs which have start and stop buttons on them and little, little red lights to tell you that services are down. That's, that's where users know it's difference. Uh, system administrators will start to see the difference because they'll be able to you know, get the status of all their services, they'll be able to have services restart in case of failure, you know, emails of like failure logs and so on. So. I suppose it should be really clear about what the System 5 in it does, therefore. It, it, uh, as I understand it, it's the first process that started uh, once the kernel is alive, and it is responsible for, what, stopping and starting different bits of, of network technology? Uh, right, so it's, yes, it's the, in it is the first process. Um, it's the process the kernel starts. Uh, it's also the process the kernel cares about. It's like the only one. If in it exits, the kernel will panic. Um, it don't, you know, you, it's the process that lasts as long as the system's up. Therefore, it has the responsibility to start all of the other processes. So ultimately, in it has to start everything from setting your host name, which is the very first thing I think it pretty much does, mounting slash proc, you know, all the, the underlying file systems, to starting your X server, and at that point your X server has, you know, a session manager that starts your desktop up, so, but um, fundamentally, you know, it's the process that starts everything, and when you shut down, it's the process that stops everything as well, it goes around and shuts down all your services. So apart from the fact it wasn't maintained, what was wrong with the old System 5 in it? So the old one's kind of designed, but it's, the, the code we use is, was written by uh, Debian, um, very early on, and um, was based entirely on design on the um, the System Five in it, demon. So of course, this Five in it, um, and it's you know a design that's going back to the sixties and the seventies. You know, you you don't really have <coughs> well to give an example. If we take Apache or Squid or any of the other kind of services. You, there's, no, there's no primitives in there to say is Apache running, is Squid running and there's no real way of saying st- you know, how to start Apache so we have these large 100 line plus shell scripts which figure out if the system's in a clean state where it can start Apache, clean up the system do things necessary to get Apache running, start Apache and then to stop it you have to cut, well, we'll query the status of it, you have to find Apache you, know, there's no, you can't just ask the init demon what's Apache's PID um, then to stop it again you still have to find Apache you have to figure out whether it's right, whether to stop it tell it to stop, wait for it to stop, send it term signal, maybe wait for that to happen, we're going to send it a kill signal, um, then clean up after. There's so much stuff that it just doesn't do that all of this stuff should be built into the init daemon. You should be able to just tell the init daemon the, what's unique about this service compared to the others. So Upstart will effectively make initd scripts redundant? Right, exactly. Um, and in fact, an Upstart in it, a sub dot job file pretty much um, you know, defines, you define the process, the actual Apache command on disk. You don't define start and stop like you do with an uh, init.d script at the moment. But it doesn't do that yet? Uh, no, it currently does that, yes. Absolutely. Uh, but, and, but there are still init scripts on Ubuntu systems. Right, yeah. So there's the, we've been using upstart in a, in a method that provides backwards compatibility with sys5 init. Um, this is quite important to us. Um, the LSB still mandates sys5 init scripts. Um, the commercial vendors still ship them. There's software that's going to be years and years before it can be migrated to Upstart, if at all. So it's something we have to support forever. Um, and that's okay. We can we can support that forever. But it allows means also means we don't have a flag day. We can convert things to using Upstart natively one at a time when when it's appropriate for us to do so. And we've sort of shied away from doing this just yet because we've been testing. We've been learning about you know how this code we've written works and what the side effects of it are, you know, how to bring it you know, I have um, a system which is entirely upstart based. Um, it's not in Ubuntu yet, but it's um, available from my my people page and so on. Uh, if people want to grab me, just grab, ask me about it. Just ask me about it. Um, and we're just learning about it, and it means that we're able to make the decision when to start moving fully to upstart on a not early, too early. We can make it when we guaranteed not to break anything. And when we do it, <coughs> the, as I say, the effect of the users will be not you know they won't be able to tell. And that that I think is worthwhile. I mean. There should be a performance increase in terms of um, starting services and things, though. So what you tend to see, it's not that services start faster. Obviously, services start as fast as they go. And we're doing other work at the same time in parallel to reduce startup time of services anyway. Um, but what you tend to see is that we can start groups of services together. In, you know, For example, we can start the debus daemon, and then we can start 
sort of services that last as long as the computer together when the debus daemon is actually ready rather than having you know shell scripts that are sleeping in a loop trying to work out where the debus is ready you know we know the debus daemon is up um we can then you know have sh- shell scripts I mean, we get rid of shell scripts that loop waiting for hal to be ready instead we know that hal is up you we take out a lot of this kind of overhead and the system appears to come up faster the fact that many debus services started at the same time or even on demand um will, will make the system appear to come up start faster so yeah the system will come up faster but it starts a tool for helping that it's not it doesn't just give you that for free you have to do other things so when it can group services, would it mean that you could have a group of services start and then start downloading your email while the rest starts? Um, absolutely, in theory, yeah. Uh, there's, there's no theoretical reason why not. Yeah. So how does Upstart know when you need a particular service? <laughs> <laughs> so you services kind of depend on each other. So there are things you only need if a web server is running. There's things you only need if uh, you know, you've, you've got something on your system. So, that, so there's a lot of those can can be <coughs> only started up when you when you actually need them. Um, they, then a lot of other services that aren't like that, they're based on hardware. Um, you only need to have the Bluetooth services running if you've got Bluetooth hardware on your computer. And not just Bluetooth hardware on your computer, but the hardware kill switch turned off. So you, the services at the end, the, the hardware is actually powered up. Um, if you move your Bluetooth sw- sw- uh, kill switch to on, then the Bluetooth stack of software should close down. You don't want that using your resource. Um, and this is done because the kernel, in the 2.6 kernel, has incrementally and fantastically improved in this regard of notifying user space all about what's happening. We have uh, the UDEV daemon, which um, receives all these events from the kernel and dispatches them. We have HAL, which is gradually being replaced by something called Device Kit, which provides DBUS notification of these to software on the system. And via these mechanisms, Upstart receives the same notification. So a service can simply depend on a network device or a Bluetooth device as easily as it can depend on another service. The only difference is if you try and start the service manually, it um, will fail because the network device isn't available. It'll tell you, it will tell you it needs a network device. So. Is there an argument that says that the Bluetooth stack, for example, shouldn't start when you connect the device, but when you actually want to use it? Um, absolutely. The, 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 actually, it's um, worth sort of drawing those distinction there. Um, you, there are some pieces of overhead you need to, for the device to function. Um, in the Bluetooth case, you need to be able, a lot of the Bluetooth stack is actually done in software, not in uh, hardware. And while you, while when you say you may need to use it, that pre-assumes you invoke the use of it from the machine. So you would, um, if you want to send a file from your laptop to your mobile phone, we can certainly only start the send software and the the parts of the service we need for that when you try and send a file from your laptop to your mobile phone. When you send a file from your phone to your laptop, you need to have something there that is waiting for those requests. So we do need to start some software up to be listening for requests to the laptop. And again, when those requests come in, then we start additional pieces of software on demand to you know, to deal with that request. So if you're doing the file transfer, your file transfer part would only start and stop when you need it to. The actual thing dealing with the uh, announcements of the device and you know uh, broadcasting its existence have to be started already for, for the opposite to be able to work. Um, likewise with printing, we can start the printer service when you want to print a document, but that then won't tell you if there are pending documents or there's a printer fault or it's out of ink or anything until you first print a document, which is exactly too late. <laughs> you, know, you want to know about that kind of thing before you print, not after you print. So. And you've also been looking at boot speed and how what we can do to speed up how fast Ubuntu boots? Uh, yeah, that's what my other day job is uh, boot performance work, yes. Yeah. I, I thought your other day job was comparing uh, UDS. Compare, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> yes I, one of the other things I do, I do run the Ubuntu Developer Summit. But no, um, my, my former day job is uh, boot, the boot system and the plumbing layer of Ubuntu. And um, the boot performance work we've been doing, which is... Uh, been a push for Jaunty has been to um, cut out a lot of the the things we do on boot that we don't need to do on boot and uh, we're, we've seen quite a few improvements. Um, something we we did a few releases ago as far back as uh, Hori, um, our second ever release and it's, it's got worse again since then. We Hori booted in 30 seconds so we're hoping Jaunty will too. So, And what are the sort of things that you're doing to try and get that time down? It's, it's a, lot of, a lot of kind of complicated process to be honest, not a complicated process. Um, 
first of all, you just look at a piece of software, you know, what does it do when it, you start it? Some software warps the file system. I mean, that's going to be expensive. Um, do you, you can, you know, does it need to do that? Is it maybe doing too much? Is it some things don't only warp the file system, they, they check for the existence of the files they found by walking for the file system, then they open them. Whereas you could just walk the file system opening all the files, the open will fail and tell you it's not found. You know? There's just simple improvements like that. And by far the disk is the slowest point of the boot. I mean, you, if you want a fast boot, get a faster disk. Um, so, you know, eliminating disk usage, we've been looking into software that was clearly inefficient. Uh, Modprobe and the, is a very good example here where the it was very, very slow and inefficient. So we've replaced that. Modprobe is the uh, program that loads kernel modules in, into the kernel for, to give extra device drivers and functionality? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's the, it's the code that loads drivers. Um, and it was, it was very, very expensive to find a driver with Modprobe. Um, we now have... Um, thanks to some work by Fedora, and we've got the patches in there. Done a lot of the patches as well for that, with a um, binary index for that. And um, so, we, when you do you know, the overhead of that, is virtually non-detectable. So, driver loading is much, much faster than it was in previous releases. Um, you know, and other silly things like we discovered that um, a piece of software was uh, that we ran on boot was loading the um, the app to the, the software repository cache into memory and checking the cache to figure out the versions of particular pieces of software so it could work out which version of a Ubuntu it was running on. And th there were two obvious bugs with this. The first of which was that the version of Ubuntu is hard-coded in a configuration file anyway, and this program, after doing this very expensive work, overwrote it with the, versions, the, the information in that config file anyway. Um, and also, secondly, this piece of software could have could know that by and it, when we build the package. It can be built into the package. So There's, There are things like that. Sometimes it's just, you know, you boot it up, you use a tool like Bootchart to... Um, look at what you do on boot and then where you see obvious things taking time you start you'd go into them use tools like strace and sometimes just getting the code and adding printfs into it to figure out what it's doing you figure out what it doesn't need to do that it does you remove that you redo it hopefully you you've just gained yourself a tenth of a second a quarter of a second you do that three times a day for <laughs> three different things and keep going for three weeks and uh, you know you've given yourself you know probably by that point four or five seconds so. Why do you think boot speed is so important to people? Um, well, it's the, the fundamentally, it's, if you're going to open your laptop, you don't want to sit and wait for it to boot. Um, so, I mean, I, I have a laptop now which I've got booting even, even, even faster than you'll see jaunty booting, but that's because I kind of deleted everything I don't care about. Um, and it meant that I was on the bus on the way here, able to get my, over here to Fostem, able to get my laptop out, and immediately within 10 seconds, I was, had a terminal open and was coding, and then, as soon as the and shutdown speed is important as well, because as soon as the laptop pulled up, you know, so the laptop, the bus pulled up to uh, to the um, university here, I was able to just t press the power button, close the lid, and it was off by the time it hit my bag. You know, it was. It means it gives you a much, much faster response time. You know, you don't want to. If, you know, if you desktop, you're fine. You go on, you switch your desktop on, you go and make a cup of coffee, you come back and it's on. That's fine, but. When you're looking at the, especially the smaller target market of a pocket-sized device or a, certainly a, a handbag-sized device, you're, you, it, they really rely on you being able to pull these things out and just start work on them straight away because otherwise you will just go and walk upstairs and use your desktop, at which point the, you know, the $300 netbook you just bought is kind of useless. It sounds like a lot of the problems are from like legacy things, sort of historical. Is it because things have been bolted on gradually and the way that the interact has never been checked out and is it possible to stop future additions causing problems that's very true that's very true um so first of all there's a lot of legacy in the hardware i mean you you go buy on a brand new laptop today it still has a serial port in it it might be just a couple of pins on the motherboard that you can't see but it does um it's still probably got old buses that we've not used since the 1980s in it because it's needed to support legacy system so if you go buy a macbook air that doesn't have any of this stuff when they designed that in, they worked with intel to take away all the legacy things which makes it a very very clean platform to start with and in the software i mean we Unix has a very long history. Uh, we've inherited that history and we've built on it. So while we have a graphical X server with all this compos compositing and everything else on it, underneath all that, we have a standard X server, which is still able to perform all of the X, X kind of things that it used to do back in the 70s. And underneath that, we still have a text console, probably multiple text consoles, still which have you know, been the same. You know, we have a lot of layers of it. And you know, one of the simplest things we do is start removing the older layers. We, we say, right, well, we're not going to... If you want a text console, that's well and good. But if you're booting into graphics, you don't need the text console there. 
Um, you or know. you certainly don't need six of them. Well, yeah, you, what's that? You don't need six of them. You don't need six of them, yeah. In fact, actually, I was talking with one of our server um, developers just last week, and he's of the opinion we don't need six of them on the server. You need one running screen. So. Oh, yeah, I think I've heard about that kind of a, a screen as a login shell, effectively, that will just uh, enable you to have stats and things at the bottom as well. Yeah, ex- exactly. It's uh, Dustin Kirkland's work, yes. Um, but you know, and also, when you're on the graphics, you don't need, you know, we always say, oh, well, we need to be able to get back to the console, or we need to be able to do this. And then you ask why, and it's, well, because X crashes. And I'm of the opinion that when X crashes, you shouldn't be trying to get to a console to finish your work. You should be working out what that bug was that crashed X and fixed that. You know, Only power developers need to be able to have that access. Most people would just reboot at that point. I guess it's easy to optimise for, for boot speed and, and if you do strip out stuff that you don't need. But yeah. the, the trouble with the general distribution is that it's got to answer a whole range of people's needs. Um, very true. Um, however, we, we, we are at least lucky that we have several general distributions. We have Ubuntu desktop CDs, which if you're booting a desktop live CD and installing from that, I think it's quite clear you're, you're installing a desktop or a laptop. Um, we have a server CD, so you know, the install profile of the server CD can be different. Um, and we have um, you know, sort of net, net install CDs, we have netbook you know, net images and so on. It, it's, you know, each one is quite clear that you're, you're already having a different target. If you're installing UNR, the Ubuntu Network Remix, on a laptop, it's, you know, you w- I don't think someone should expect to have a legacy console there. I don't think they should expect to have possibly even you know, the you know, basic, you know, basic things that you might expect on a, des- even a desktop to work. Um, whereas on a, you know, on a server, you don't expect to have an X server there. So I think in the same way we can customize each image. There'll certainly be different speeds from each of them. But. Is the installer fairly intelligent as to what hardware you've got, or does it lay down the same packages regardless of whether you've got Bluetooth in, insta- uh, you know, included? Uh, the, yeah, the installer is, is entirely dumb in this regard, which is exactly as we want it. Um, the we, the live CD installer we actually have is mostly just a copy interface. Um, we already boot the live CD, so we just copy the image off. Um, the installer, the traditional alternate installer, is more complicated, and especially in the, the Debian case it inherits from it, it can do all sorts of things like that. But uh, I think th- there's also a, t- a trade-off. When you start putting too much customization into the installer, the install process becomes more complicated. And I think one of the wins of Ubuntu has always been that you put this disk in, you enter some basic details like your name and where you live and then you have a system and it's much easier to customize the actual system from the, the, you know, the full kind of software we have there to do it than it is from an installer. So sometimes I think you know, installing it to a, a basic specification and then adding optional features or installing it to a full specification and removing optional features are both valid preferred ways to, to do this. Excellent. Okay, well thank you for talking to us. Okay, thank you. That was a great, uh, great interview. There, Tony. Who was that again? That was Scott James Remnant. It, yeah, sometimes it's quite good to hear about these sort of insides. So, I mean, it's what they call plumbing, isn't it? Where it all, all comes together. It was really quite scary when he said that Hori booted in thirty seconds, and it's got worse, probably to the extent of about sixty seconds in a recent distribution in uh, Jaunty. Yeah, and then you look at what Hori doesn't support that <laughs> a modern one does. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you can kind well, of see I've why. I've actually found Jaunty to be really fast. Really fast. Yeah, I have. I've. Uh, it's it's pretty quick. Um, the only the only problem I have with Jaunty at the moment is the video driver for Intel is a bit ropey. And actually, uh, I understand uh, Intel Wireless has got some criticism as well. Um, it tends to work for me, but yeah, I mean, uh, well, so someone uh, commented the other day that you're actually better off getting Broadcom now rather than Intel. <laughs> and how a... things have changed. Yeah. So, but why is boot speed so important to people? I don't. I don't. I don't know if I get it. I can see that if you want to start doing something, you want to start doing something fairly quickly. But have you got that yeah. little free time yeah. that 10 seconds difference is a killer for you? That's just a different mindset, isn't it? I, I mean, mean some people who... If you're working, if you're, yeah. if you're genuinely working, then it, it would be a frustration. But if you're sat at home and you just want to do some surfing, then you know I tend to turn it on, walk away and come back and it's, it's done when it's done. But, yeah, but should you have to do that? But Well, it doesn't... For well, me, suspend it doesn't really option. figure. Yeah, well, but, you know, whatever. Suspend but, or hibernate is yeah. the other option. Well, yes, yeah, it's actual doing that. It's fine. It's whether it comes back. But you, if you're working, you turn your laptop on, you sit and you work it all day, and you turn it off at the end of the day. No, that's not that's not everyone's use case. I I travel one and a half to two hours each way to work, and I change trains two to three times along the way. Okay. So I want. And then when to... you get to work. 
No, no, I'm working on my laptop on the train. Oh, right. Is okay. what I mean. So I'm not sat at a desk. I'm sat on a train and then I get up and get on another train. Right. And then I get off and sit out on a platform and want to use my laptop there. Okay. So ideally, I would want suspend to work so I can just slam the lid shut and it suspends so that it's not blowing hot air into my laptop bag. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's conserving some battery. But okay. if that doesn't work, then I want it to boot up fast. And because suspend, resume, hibernate on Linux is not perfect, I would want fast boot speed as an alternative. So 30 seconds is no good, but 20 seconds is brilliant. Well, no, as there was a recent article from uh, Intel on Linux Weekly News, and they said we shouldn't be aiming uh, for things like shaving a couple of seconds off. We should be aiming for the very, very lowest, like five seconds. Yeah. Mm. Don't aim for 30, yeah, 20, we, 10. Yeah, we talked about that in previous episode, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. Yeah, and I can see that. I can see if, you know, it's effectively five seconds is almost instant on. Mm. By the time you've opened it and focused your eyes on the screen, it's practically there. And that seems like a target that does make a difference to people. But uh, people are arguing over, oh, mine's three seconds faster than yours or five seconds slower or whatever. What are you going to do usefully with those five seconds? Okay, how have a how, scratch? How annoyed would you be if your TV took thirty seconds to power up? How annoyed would you be if the microwave took thirty seconds to power up? It's an appliance. It's a device. You want to turn it on. And you want to use it. You want to use it at the point when you turn it on, not thirty seconds later. If we look fifteen twenty years ago, when we had things like the spectrums, yeah, yeah. Now you could be taking a game on one of them could take fifteen minutes to load. I remember we, it well. We could have been having the same discussion then, saying, well, why do you want it faster? You know, what, what are you going to do? And I think as time goes on, people expect more and more. Yeah, but 15 minutes is something I could usefully do something with. I could yeah, get, make forget. a cup yeah, of tea. I bet, yeah, I bet but, when you had a spectrum, yeah. you didn't do anything useful with that 15 minutes. You just watched, I was a, you just I was a kid. I was you'd, young. I, didn't, I wasn't allowed out of the house. <laughs> you'd, you'd, watch the, <laughs> you'd watch the little counter going down in the corner yeah. of the screen, or you'd watch the colour bars, and you'd know when it was coming. But the thing is, the if we had the same discussion then... Yeah, you'd be, you, we would be saying, well, hang on, you know, it, take, it used to take an hour to load. You know, what, what's the problem? You know, it's not like it takes an hour anymore. It only takes 15 minutes. And in a few years' time, when we say your laptop takes five seconds, mine's instant. You know, I can press the power button and I've got my desktop with my applications and I'm already connected to the network. You've got to wait a whole five seconds. You know, it's, it's exactly the same. It's just orders of magnitude smaller. I mean, Xandros have actually pushed a lot into this at the moment. They, they've released a new one called uh, Presto. And, and part of their main thing is... is the speed of the boot and you know so i think it's is there there is a huge use case for people wanting a like an almost an instant on laptop okay uh have we got some feedback from our twitter account yeah we're just um laura's uh twittering as we go and there's been some feedback um uh david futcher says as long as it uh, boots in under three minutes he doesn't care at all Um, see that's that's one arbitrary figure three minutes (laughs) someone else is 30 seconds someone else is five you know it's Zoke says the boot speed is sort of important. I mean, I don't want to take my PC. I don't want my PC to take twenty minutes to boot, but I turn my PC on and go and have a cup of tea. There, there's your perfect example. You've got two ends of the same scale. It's, well, it's no, all about perception, isn't it? I, I think Zoke could be quite happy with three minutes, same same sort of scale, really, because that's the cup of tea making time. Okay, what I mean, what about your? You, I mean, you, you've got a Wii. Um, you know, how do you feel that took longer than? I mean, how long does it take? About like twenty. Wii seconds? does take ages to start. Does it? Yeah, it does. yeah. yeah. Wii's are very, yeah, very does. slow. Oh, I, I didn't know that. I the know the, that. the premise of the Wii is that you should be able to turn it on and be in a game within a minute. I, I believe that was the original premise of the design of the thing. So people, you know, if it's over a minute, people don't like it. So William the Nice uh, reckons uh, that. In a, in a geeky sense, it's really important. In a practical sense, as long as it's not five minutes, it's not really that important. So we're definitely getting sort of two two mm-hmm. ideals, aren't we? One that says, yeah, you know, whatever, it's on when it's on. And the other, which is, actually, I really need to do something right now. Let's get on with it. Yeah. yeah. One There's a there's a podcast with a guy called John Dvorak, John C. Dvorak. And something he pointed out was the number of times he goes out of the house. And as he goes out of the house, he shuts his computers down. And the number of times he forgets the, to print the directions or look at the directions for where he's going or finding um, the name of the restaurant or something. And he wants to go back and press the button but not have to wait for the whole time for the PC to boot. He just wants to, you know, instant on. And that's where he sees the, the use of the the Linux on the BIOS, yeah. you know, where you turn it on and it mm. is, like, pretty much instant. So he could just go to his email and find out the address and, you know, and then turn it off again. That's what you've got mobile phones for, isn't it? Well... 
Yeah, and how long do they take to boot up? <laughs> yeah, but they're always on. Actually, um, you, um, most actually you've got like, a Nokia or yeah. something. Yeah, but I mean, um, as I, <laughs> or they even have lost it, or left it in a pub somewhere, <laughs> or a train. I mean, as I actually understand it, with mobiles, um, they're normally in a state of suspend rather than power off. It's only when you retake the battery out or the battery goes completely flat. So, I mean, they actually have reduced speed by being in a state of suspend. Okay, we'll take your word for that as the telephone guru. Oh, well, I don't um, know about that. Moving on from the boot speed thing, the rest of the changes in Jaunty, um, the other big one that's been causing a ding-dong has been this change to the notification area. Um, Alan, you've been following that bug quite closely. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was a... Mark gave a demonstration, Mark Shuttleworth gave a demo at UDS yeah. showing the new notification bubbles. In the past, prior to Jaunty, lots of applications in the notification area, the little bit next to the clock, could pop up um, little dialogues to tell you Um, that your battery is low or that there are updates or that it's switched to the next track or whatever it might be to tell you something and there weren't there was no unification and one of the ideas behind this new notification system that's in jaunty is that you have a unified notification and it looks nice Mm. and it's just notifications i mean uh, mark mark shuttleworth actually did a really quite a long blog post on it wasn't it saying you know it shouldn't be interactive it should be just notification you put your mouse over it goes transparent yeah so if you if you've got compies enabled and you one of these notifications pops up if you move your mouse over it you can actually click through it to whatever was behind it so if there was like a an icon behind it that was you know like the close for the window you're currently on you can still click on it i do wonder how many people when that first comes out are going to try and click on the notification thing it goes away or they click through it and close their application <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a bad virus that moves the okay thing all over the screen <laughs> incidentally so i on. haven't actually done that yet i'm surprised i mean i don't know whether it's just luck or not well, you haven't tried to click on it uh, I, I think i have tried to click on it but i mean well, when it when it was mid um you know when jaunty was a, was a little bit less stable um there was a lot of applications that weren't compatible with it. Mm, yeah. And that was a whole world of bad news, wasn't it? Because basically, if you were running things like Gwibber, uh, which is the, um, which is the Twitter, Twitter client. IRC client, uh, Twitter client, isn't it? And uh, what you'd find is traditionally you'd have you know 20 or 30 would suddenly just appear on your screen and just take over. So, so that's a really bad use of notification. But, the, uh, but because it was incompatible with the, with the newer Notify, um, what would happen is, is you get pop ups like the you know oh, you of get a load of like nasty like messenger like pop ups yeah, all over the, all all the all screen. These dialogues. But that, that's been fixed, and they've yeah. fixed a lot of the well, most of the apps that that are duff. But one thing that a lot of people have been arguing about, and if you want to follow the bug, it's uh, bug number three three two nine four five on Launchpad, Arr. and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a bit of a ding dong because well, there's two things. One is that the notification icon, the orange icon that you used to get in the corner um, that tells you you've got updates is gone. That's not going to be there anymore. Right. So you're no longer going to get a, a little pop, a little uh, orange icon or the red arrow that tells you there is updates. That's gone. And that's caused a bit of a stir. And the second problem is the way that you get told that there are updates is if you haven't run apt, aptitude or update manager or synaptic for a week and there are updates update manager will pop under whatever you've got open to tell you to do your updates. Yeah, yeah, because there was a bit of controversy about it actually appearing underneath and not on top. But I think Yeah, I can, I can see why underneath and not on top, because if you're watching a movie and it's your Myth TV box, you don't want update manager to pop up over the top of your, TV, of your movie. Yeah, that's fair enough. But if I'm running a desktop... I might want to be able to see that there are notifi- that there are updates available. Yeah, but hang on, if you're if you're writing if you're writing an email, yeah, you don't want to suddenly get interrupted. You want to you want to be able to see that when you happen to minimise. Well, that. I don't at the moment. It appears in the system tray. It's a little orange thing. It goes bing, and then there's a little alert for five seconds, or whatever, and it goes away. And you choose to click it. And if then you want to. I may later in the evening, maybe when I finish writing my email, and you know. I may choose to install those packages. But, I may choose to leave it a couple of days. But we are the kind of people that actually want to know these things, and again. There are a lot of people out there that don't really care. Mm-hmm. And you have, you have Seriously, to... I've got three... Sorry, David, just cut you off a second. There are three people sat in my house, each with their own computers, that really don't care and don't do updates. I think the majority of Windows users are like that as well. But would they if a thing popped up? If the update manager popped up, like if they, had, if they hadn't run any updates for a week and your son walked up to his machine, turned it on, and then after like 10 minutes of not doing anything or whatever, he's got a browser open, update manager pops up. And when he's finished with his laptop, he closes Firefox. Is he going to apply the updates or is he going to go and close it? Good question. I don't really know. 
Because if, if he doesn't do them, then it kind of mitigates the argument for not having the icon. Because in his case, it's irrelevant how you tell him to do updates. He's not going to apply them anyway. Yeah, I've been living with that with Crunchbang, actually. You don't oh, because you don't get an you icon. Don't get yeah. You don't get it. You've got to you know go in and do it manually. Now, I, I know on the alternate, um, which is the, the older style installation method, and uh, now we do actually get asked whether you want to switch on automatic updates, automatic security updates, which I think is a really good thing that a lot of people should do. Automatically security, apply them. Automatically apply security updates. Wow. Which which I think is a good idea, to be honest. I, I think system administrators and power users will be nervous about it, but for the vast majority of users, it makes a lot of sense. But the vast majority of users won't use the alternate CD. Oh, it, it, so it, they'll it, never it, see I that. I assume this is a technology it, 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 demonstration at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's only an or, option. Or so you think it'll OEMs. go in the live CD later, or maybe? I think it should. I think it should. I mean, you, it's a tick box. I mean, we probably shouldn't do it from default, but certainly have the option to say, do you want to automatically apply? Well, of course, the alternate CD's got the OEM installer, so presumably, you could have, if you're setting up as an OEM thing, you could have your systems that you're selling or reselling with Ubuntu do that automatically. Mm. Sound, sound sensible? Yeah. Yeah, you could. If you, I mean, that could be one of your unique selling points. Don't worry about updates. It does it for you. And while you're in the middle of browsing the web, Firefox can get an update and you can now, longer, now no longer edit the email you were just editing yeah. because Firefox is, needs a restart. Uh, yeah, but no, you, know, yeah, yeah. You, you can normally still get away with carrying on. It normally warns you of an update. I mean, what does? Uh, F- Firefox would come up saying Firefox needs to restart, but you can normally finish yeah, but that what pops you're under. Doing. That pops under. That's yeah, that. so you can finish writing that email. No, but this is the point. If you if you turn on fully automatic, there is an impact to the user in that if a certain application like Firefox is updated, then if you fully automate fully automate it in the background, they're not going to know. I, I would say the priority is to get security updates out as quickly as possible. It depends on whose point of view you're looking at, really. What does the wonderful world of Twitter say, Simon? The wonderful world of Twitter says, uh, Andrew Gee, the notification bubbles look great with compis on, uh, but annoy me without compis on, uh, as they don't fade. He prepares, prefers to have um, compis off. Yeah, they don't. If you've got compis switched off, you just they just disappear. Oh, when you put they, your mouse yeah, they, they did. I don't know if they do now, but they did leave a little box. Uh, yeah, they leave a black, black box Is, is that it. still there? I, uh, I haven't tried I that don't know. I don't know, actually. I suppose it I'll, does wait, it. I'll wait for someone to Twitter and then I'll put my mouth over <laughs> and tell you. Um, so William the Nice uh, reckons uh, they're full of win. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's sending in Batty. Oh, that's the update no- notifier yeah, thing, right. sending in Batty. He doesn't want it removed. He'd like it to work. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all want that, really. Yeah. But uh, Mark Shuttleworth sort of said quite um, firmly in the bug that it's going to happen anyway. So, yeah. Don't go moaning about it. Well, I, I think a lot of people were quite rude. And because uh, people get quite heated and believe quite strongly one way or the other. And I think Mark tried to calm them down. I mean, he, yeah. he did actually base it on uh, reason judgment because he actually based it on a usability expert, didn't he? Allegedly so, yeah. So True. that's that's probably about it, isn't it, for, for Jaunty? I mean, there's lots of new stuff in Jaunty, but those are the main things that we've heard about recently. Um, we did note that Plymouth... Oh, oh, someone which... just Twittered and I put my mouse over it and there's no box around it. It just disappears. Genius. In answer to Dave's question earlier. Thanks. Genius. <laughs> um, we did note that Plymouth, which is the funky Fedora boot screen, which I saw a couple of days ago and does look very, very nice and swish, is not going to get into uh, Ubuntu this release. Um, and maybe the next one. Maybe in the next one, um, which is a bit of a shame because it does look really quite swish. Uh, we've got a kind of Night Rider throbber going on instead, haven't we? But if your boot speed is so fast, do you really care what it looks like? If it's five seconds, I'm happy. Yeah. I don't mind five seconds looking at a butt ugly <laughs> boot up screen. <laughs> Free Software Foundation have joined forces with Floss Manuals to write a GNU slash Linux command line manual designed for newbies. Presumably, once it's actually been written, it'll be okay to tell people to RTFM. A command line manual for newbies, that's a contradiction in terms, isn't it? Well, do you know what? They, it got done in two days. It was a re- Normally the Floss Manuals guys who, who write loads and loads of manuals for all kinds of different free software write uh, spread over days and days and days, and that was done in two days flat. Microsoft and TomTom had their sue and counter sue over FAT32 and their GPS navigation disagreement. They've now come to a solution. TomTom will be removing the long file name within the next two years. They've also licensed the patents from Microsoft. Very sad day. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see who was going to get lost on their way to the courthouse. The Wall Street Journal have reported that IBM are in negotiations to buy Sun. 
owner of OpenSolaris, MySQL, OpenOffice.org, and VirtualBox. If it goes ahead, what will it mean for the future of these open source projects? Mm. Yeah. Bit of a question mark, really. Well, of course, because IBM have got their other solutions, haven't they, for the same things? Yeah, mm. unless they open source DB2. Did- <laughs> GNOME 2.26 has been released, featuring a revised Brasero CD and DVD burning application, a new volume control, and much more. Impressively, Evolution can now also import Outlook PST files, as well as talking directly to the Exchange server using the MAPI protocol. Do people use MAPI? Well, I guess if you're using Exchange. Oh. But that's fairly funky, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose we should applaud that. I, w- I was expecting you lot to moan on about how Evolution is unstable rubbish and you'd never use it. Nobody yep. here uses Evolution. Yes, but it's D. still better than Outlook. I'm, <laughs> I am dual booting between Evolution and Thunderbird. Okay. Everyone's favourite flightless bird, the ever popular Tux, has been replaced as the official mascot of Linux for the 2.6.29 kernel cycle. The replacement is Tuz, a similar, overweight, but perhaps less cute, endangered Tasmanian devil. Wow. Linux and the Green Lobby really getting... So does that mean together? when you boot up, instead of seeing two little tuxes on a, on a dual-core machine, you'll two, see two little Tasmanian well, devils? you won't actually see any difference because we don't have that enabled. What, in Ubuntu? For us, we don't see it, do we? Yeah. Oh, how sad. I want to buy a stuffed, cuddly Tuz now. I'm, no, gonna, I'm, I, not, I, I'm not being funny, but that Tuz is ugly, really, isn't it? I'm tempted to get a vanilla kernel from kernel.org now and recompile it just so I get Tuzzes. <laughs> Mustachioed rifle enthusiast, fetch mail author and comic strip star Eric S. Raymond has given a speech claiming that the GPL is no longer needed. Rumour has it that the GPL is planning a speech saying Eric Raymond is no longer needed. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody loves Eric Raymond. Dot com. The first beta of Ubuntu Jaunty is now available from releases.ubuntu.com, including all of the update notification Wizziness that we were talking about earlier. Obviously, only try it if you're a daredevil and fancy um, trying it and reporting any bugs you have. You also need to read the known issues because there are a lot of them. And consider the torrent rather than doing a direct download. Good luck, everybody. We've got a few upcoming events to announce. First one is the uh, jaunty release, of course, on uh, Thursday, the 23rd of April. Uh, which will be sometime on that day. Obviously, there's no time specified, and it could be at any point when they flick the switch and uh, release it. There's an IRC channel called Hash Ubuntu Dash Release Dash Party on the Freenode Network. Join that, and don't ask when it's going to be released. <laughs> when you say join that for some fun, you actually mean um, join that to watch lots of people go. Is it out yet? Is it out yet? And people posting links to stuff that isn't the release. That yes. does sound like fun. And we also have some real-life release parties, don't we? Yes, we do. Uh, There's one in Manchester um, at the BBC in Oxford Road, and that's on Friday the 24th of April, so that's the day after the release. And uh, you have to sign up for that one because uh, there's a a list you've got to be on before the BBC will let you in the door. But it's it's great the BBC are actually allowing us to have a release party in their premises. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, it's in a a bar in uh, in the BBC. Okay, we'll put a link in the show notes for that. Yep. And on the day before that, on the actual release itself, we're having a party in London, which was organised by Canonical. Uh, We'll put a link to that as well. Uh, It's in a bar that holds up to 250 people, I think. We've also been asked to play a trailer for the Southeast USA uh, Linux Fest, which is on June the 13th, 2009, and you can hear that now. The Southeast Linux Fest is a community event for anyone who wants to learn more about Linux and free and open source software. It is part educational conference and part social gathering. Like Linux itself, it is shared with the attendees of all skill levels to communicate tips and ideas and to benefit all who use Linux and free and open source software. The Linux Fest is a place to learn, to make new friends, to network with new business partners, and most importantly, to have fun. Come join us for the first annual Southeast Linux Fest on June 13, 2009 in Clemson, South Carolina. Register today at southeastlinuxfest.org. Whilst you lot were on your travels to UDS and I was stuck at work, you managed to um, to blag some rather nice things we can give away uh, in a competition. What have we got? We've got another copy of Ubuntu Kung Fu, the book by Keir Thomas that we reviewed way back in Season 1. Um, we've got an Ubuntu Guru t-shirt, 
in a range of uh, sizes from medium large and extra large so if you fit one of those three sizes you're good um, and we've got a load of ubuntu stickers and uh, ubuntu lanyard and uh, a cap which we'll give you as well so a nice little bundle of ubuntu related fashion uh, accessories really don't forget the top prize okay what's that then the dressing gown from the hotel we robbed oh you're supposed to keep quiet about that oh i thought the top prize was a lovely perfectly formed cd with oh, ubuntu yes. on it yeah, maybe twenty or thirty of those in the box. Actually, <laughs> yeah. If you don't, if you don't mind, fifty copies of the server CD, then we'll send you those. <laughs> okay. So to celebrate our return in season two, that's the little bundle of, of prizes we got together. So we need a question. What's the name of the software project started by Scott James Remnant, which is uh, designed to replace the Init startup script? Should we give them a bit of help on this? Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Let's, let's get them warmed back into it. Go on. There's some right. options. Answer A, Init. Answer B, UDev. Answer C, Upstart. Or D, Jeff Hurst, the 1966 World Cup. Send your answer to competition at ubuntu-uk.org. The closing date will be two weeks after the release date of this episode, so look on the website to find out what that is if you're not sure. And we ask that you live in the UK or the EU in order for us to ship this to you without costing us a small fortune. But hey, if you want to enter anyway, go for it. Yeah, if you don't live in the EU and want to enter, yeah, okay. Because we do like to read your emails. We're not going to send you a prize, though. We've had loads of feedback while we were away, most of it asking, how long are we going to be away for? Well, we now have an answer to that. We're back. Two weeks. <laughs> we're back now. Um, but we have picked some of the highlights from our mailbox over the last couple of months and uh, thought we would share those with you now. Um, the first is from Paul from Hunter Valley in Australia. I don't, don't know if that's where the hunter spiders come from. They sound horrible. Um, I heard about your podcast when I was listening to Net at Night, so I downloaded all of the podcasts so I could listen to them on his way to work. His daily commute is about four hours. Four hours. So Holy cow. Yeah, so it's easy to listen to four or more podcasts in one day. I should imagine so. We need uh, to make them longer. Yeah, clearly. It's a four-hour podcast just oh, for Paul. Oh, four hours, <laughs> one minute. <laughs> yeah he sits in the car for the last minute just to listen to it um he's mentioned to, to a few mentioned a few of the items discussed on his local lug linux user group and hopefully some of them will listen to the show as well um he takes no responsibility though for neighbors or home and away being shown on our television screens well given none of us are students i don't think we watch that do we uh, uh, paul jay commented on uh, graham bin's interview it was stated that the OpenSUSE build service was closed, saw a slight launchpad. Uh, it is released under the GPL. Oh, oh. excellent. So OpenSUSE have got one over on us mm. uh, with launchpad, though. Well, the launchpad, obviously, it was about three months to release, though, isn't it? Something like that, yeah, yeah. July, something like that. Yeah. Not long now, everybody. Mm. Plus, we've got loads more users than they do. I wonder how. <laughs> I wonder <laughs> how many people are just going to check out the source just for the sake of it and not actually look at it. Hmm. Keith Drummond asked whether we could make some flash buttons so we could play the podcast from his blog. Are there any other listeners interested in this? So people could have like an embedded play the Ubuntu podcast in their blog, that kind of thing. I think that's what he's after, yeah. I think we could probably rustle something up there. Yeah, okay. Well, if you're interested in having links to that on your blog, uh, give us a shout and we'll point you in the right direction. Cool. Russell Dickinson, also from Australia, says, first off, two frank admissions. One, I don't live in the UK. And two, I don't regularly use Ubuntu. Hmm, not our demographic. Despite the above disturbing facts, he really enjoys the show. At first, he was surprised how many times Ubuntu was made fun of during the show. After a few episodes, he got used to the sarcasm. He asks, please include in the show notes for each episode the date on which the applicable competition, if any, ends. That's a good point, actually. We really should do that. Um, we're trying in this se season to um, make our releases a little bit more timely, yes. I hope. We shall see. Uh, he also says, not being familiar with the Ubuntu world, he was surprised at how many unofficial entities, possibly including the podcast, use the Ubuntu brand name. He believes Canonical should have acted sooner to limit the use of the name to official purposes only. It's confusing to see the name used and realise later that it's not directly connected to or part of the Ubuntu project. Yeah. We, we probably should mention we did actually get approval to use the name uh, for, in our podcast. It, it's tricky. What is official? You know, what's his definition of official? I would say the people who own the trademark. Getting blessing from them, to me, is making it official. Richard Querin sent us some very nice UUPC wallpapers, which we'll try and get on the website. Ah, now, Richard Querin. Good guy. He's the guy who made the screencast about Blender. We should probably talk to him at some point. Okay, sounds good. The fine chap Said Ali has sent us a track composed of sample sent to him by Richard Stallman. I'm afraid we haven't got time to include in this episode, but you can listen to it in a link from our show notes. 
yeah, it's quite interesting if you're in a bit of a weird headspace and want to hear Richard Stallman speed it up. Good effort, to be fair. I couldn't do anything like that. Aidan Delaney wrote to tell us about some projects his students at Brighton Uni are working on. He says that some of his students have done their development for their projects on Launchpad. There's a lot of code up there, but there are three projects that are particularly interesting. Uh, We'll link to these three projects in the show notes. Um, One's a GTK interface for cruise control uh, CC trade tool. If that's particularly interesting, I don't know what isn't. Um, there's uh, an HDR generation and manipulation plugin for the GIMP. So HDR is high dynamic range. These really funky photos that Sorry, I've got. I, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I was just about to explain. Oh, right. Uh, so you've got um, areas of lots of detail in shadows and lots of details in bright parts. Um, it makes photographs look a bit more like than the way the eye perceives an image. Although you can push it really far and get some really weird and wacky effects as well. There's loads of examples on Flickr. Um, And there's a final one, which is a plugin to provide Bazaar with a WDIF command, which works in the same way as the Bazaar diff command, except prints out a similar output to GNU WDIF. I've not used GNU WDIF, so I don't know what that is about. No, okay, we're getting nods and shakes here. Um, He thinks they're really cool, though, and scratch and itch projects, and they show how easily easily people can contribute um, to the FOSS code base. I am particularly impressed about this because when I did my degree, we weren't taught about version control systems at all, and especially not free software. So putting them together, nice one. Yeah, good on him. Yeah, excellent. And finally, from uh, Twitter, once we've been going, um, Josh Blacker and who else? Uh, Sir William the Nice and a couple of others have said, essentially, uh, welcome back. Good to hear us uh, recording again. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be back, I think. Yes, get back in the flow of it. Well, that about wraps up the show. Thank you for listening. And thanks to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. And particularly thanks to producer Laura, who has been tweeting and denting throughout the evening. And filtering. And filtering, yes. Um, If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or leave 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845 508 1986. You can follow us on Identica via identity.ca slash UUPC or via our Twitter feed, which is twitter.com slash UUPC. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash Ubuntu-UK channel on the Freenode IRC network. We welcome suggestions, material, tips, reviews, or rants and feedback, both positive and negative, so please do get in touch. Thank you to our network of community mirrors, who are now too numerous to list, so we're going to put a link up on the site. That's it for now. Join us next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.